Hello, welcome back to some more Traveling Travel Agency mini set reveals. Unlike part one, where I think I was a little bit harsh on the cards, I think somewhat fairly. Uh, this time there are actually cards I think we'll see play. And we're starting with the first one. This is the final tourist we're going to get for the mini set. It is Portal Mansa Skylar. Five mana, four, five mage minion that can tourist into rogue. Battle Cry, swap the cost of your lowest and highest cost spells in your hand. Big Spell Mage is going to be a thing, ladies and gentlemen. This card is bonkers. This might be the best card printed in this set. It's a little bit too hand wavy for that. I'd probably say the Tide Pool was the best card printed in this set. It's sort of the most playing, like, some of the top end decks. Uh, but this is a seriously, seriously insane card. You thought the Razzle Dazzle was good? Why not Razzle Dazzle one turn earlier with some better cards? Uh... Honestly, the way I see this card is from Big Spell Mage of the past, it's Belinda. Now, Belinda had its own advantages in the fact that it drew two cards for you, which was really powerful. And it reduced the cost of those big spells to be five mana spells. As you would swap, like, your Dragonfire Amulet, or whatever it's called, Drakefire Amulet. You would swap your Puzzle Box of yogg You would turn your Belinda into, like, a 9-9 or a 9-10 or a 10-10. And the next turn, you would play one ginormous spell, like, you know... A few turns earlier than you would otherwise. I also think Belinda originally was it a five mana minion. I think it got nerfed one time by one mana, uh, which allowed you know more response to this card. But either way, it was just you, you played Belinda, and your opponent conceded. It wasn't quite that, but it felt like it to some degree for some decks. Skylar, I think, potentially has a worse feeling than Belinda because you potentially play this on five and do disgusting things. Uh, what are the disgusting things? Well, what if the cheapest spell you swapped was a coin? Uh, and what if the highest cost spell you had in your hand... Oh, by the way, you can obviously generate coins now with Metal Detector because you're going into Rogue Land, and Rogue can generate coins. Uh, also, Greedy Partner can generate these zero-cost coins. To the big spells, though, what if you swap your coin with a Tsunami? Incredible, right? Uh, that means that on turn 5, you would play your Skylar, you would get 4 5 in stats from the Skylar, and then you would get on top of that uh, quick mass a 12 24 worth of stats from a Tsunami, which would all attack, would freeze people, you know, do the 12 extra damage, you would probably sell bodies on the board afterwards. All on turn 5! Honestly, against most decks, that is just GG. I don't think a lot of decks will be able to come back from this. Because you then also have to have, an, as an answer, some way to deal with, you know, 5 health and 6 health probably, and then maybe a little bit lower than that for ones that didn't hit the face. And you're going to be on turn 5 or 6. There are no lot of decks that can do AoE 5 and 6 damage on turns 5 and 6. So I think it legitimately is such a humongous tempo swing that if you ever do this, you're going to win the game. Like... The odds are, I don't know what the, the metrics will be on this, but unless your opponent does the reverse to you, which I will just be some sort of smorgasbord of hell, you are going to probably have like a 90% plus chance of winning the game from there. Obviously, this requires you by turn 5 to have a coin and a tsunami in your hand, which are unlikely, but not crazy. Especially if you go second and get the coin just innately. And I think if you're going second as this deck, that coin is gold dust to you. You will not use that coin for any reason. Other than if you can generate another coin and you could potentially coin out Skylar one turn early. Because obviously you could do this on turn four as well. If you could get the one mana discount on Skylar. Actually, just disgusting. Vomitrocious, as Muffy would say from Arthur. Also, if you hit Sunset Volley, which is normally running Big Spell Mage as well, that's still really disgusting. I actually think it's not as disgusting. I think like it's a tier break in terms of quality of disgustingness. But dealing 10 damage for 0 mana, getting a 10 cost minion, which is probably going to be around an 8-8 in stat line, and then also getting 4-5 in stats. So you're getting like 12-13 in stats, dealing 10 damage for 5 mana, that's pretty good. I, I would accept that as a standard card. That's an above average standard card. Uh, by the way, you, you know, get your heads out the toilet. Like, you know, we have other things to get disgusted at. Not only... Could you do this on turn 5? You get your 0 mana coin tsunami combo. Obviously, because you're in Rogue, you can play Conniving Conman the turn afterwards and get another tsunami for 4 mana instead. What's better than one zero cost tsunami? It is two 
tsunamis where one of them costs four mana instead, which is still insane. Uh, so yeah, this is potentially a disgusting amount of value. I think if you get this combo off, you're just you, you've done it. You, you've won the game. Congratulations. Enjoy the enjoy the stars. Okay. I'm actually not convinced that you would even run this in your deck. I think just the original coin tsunami value might be enough that you wouldn't put the con man in your deck. But, you know, who knows? Because con man now is saying non-rogue cards means it will recast any mage card. So the big issue with big spell mage is getting to the point where you can cheat out these big spells. Uh, Skylar potentially can, like, bring this very very early the cheat i think this is disgusting i think this will actually be a thing will it be a tier one deck i don't know it's going to depend on how likely it is for you to get a coin and a tsunami in your hand by turn and skylar for that matter by turn five it's definitely below 50 percent chances it's probably around like i don't know what it would work out as the probability i guess uh by turn five you've drawn or at least seen if you could mulligan for this because i think you would mulligan and keep this in your mulligan you're probably looking at seeing like a third of your deck. So I think it's about a 33% chance you'd have Skylar in your hand by turn five. And probably then having a coin. It depends if you, you know, go first or second, if you generate the, the, the detector and all of that jazz. It's probably around this 30% region though that you get a big spell, Skylar and a coin or something. Uh, and that just will probably win you the game. Uh, now, there is also some temptations you might want to do because, you know, you want to generate coins and you might not be happy with just the, the neutral minion. You might not be happy with just having the uh, the metal detector as well because it's only two ways of generating coins. You might want to put O Manager. You might want to put Petty Theft into your deck. But I'm going to tell you now, don't do that. That would be a really bad thing to do because it would also ruin your other existing big spell mage support. Namely, Under the Sea is so much worse if you hit like an O Manager or a Petty Theft. You've basically paid six mana for a two mana card where it randomly targets. It, it's not good. It's pretty bad. So you're probably looking for some other additional ways to put a cheap spell into your deck other than just the coin. And there are good ways of doing that as well. Miracle Salesman. Sure, you don't get the zero mana 10 cost spell. A one mana 10 cost spell, though, is still pretty good. If you end up playing this on six instead of five, I think that is acceptable. I can't believe I said that, but I think it is acceptable. Uh, similarly, you could play Tide Pools in this deck, because obviously the, the thing about big spell mages, and this is the weakness, you have to play just minions in your deck until you can get to your big spell cheaters, uh, which means you don't want to run other spells in your deck. So you could potentially put a location in there that generates you some cheap spells, Try and discover something that costs one and flip it at some point with Sky to again give you a, a nine mana discounted 10 cost spell. Uh, another really weird thing you could do is use Sweet and Snow Flurry to generate some temporary frost spells. Uh, because Skylar also says not random, it is the lowest and the highest. So you're guaranteed to get Tsunami and the coin or, you know, a one cost spell. If they're in your hand with some other generated spells, which is really like part of the other most disgusting part of this is it's very consistent once you get to the situation where you have coin, tsunami, and Skylar. Uh, but if you use Sweet and Snow Flurry, you can potentially switch the cost of one of the frost spells with your 10 drop, and then you're probably not going to play the 10 cost coin right at some point. You could actually do that though, funnily enough, with uh What's he called? I nearly called him Millhouse Mana Storm, but he's not Millhouse Mana Storm. DJ Mana Storm, right? You can actually reduce this back to zero again in the future anyway. Uh, and you can also reduce it down to five if you really want to do with King Tide. That would obviously not be a good play. Five mana to play, get one mana. Uh, so for the most part, you're not going to play this expensive coin or whatever it turns out to be, the expensive snake oil. With Sweet and, Sweet and Snow Flurry, you potentially swap the card, you get this temporary 10 cost spell that you're never going to cast, and it just gets discarded from your hand, and you don't have to deal with it in the future. It's actually worth noting on this, I don't think you will use the Sweet and Snow Flurry because it's very inconsistent. You might just draw two really expensive frost spells, which would be big sad times. You can hit a zero cost frost spell though for it. Death Knight has got one, in which case that is similar to doing the coin. And also, in the hand wavy aspect of it, as I said, you have to survive until you can get to the, the big cheat. Sweet and Snow Flurry does come in early enough that maybe it does help you survive, but I don't think it's good enough quality to make play into that deck. I think you're fine, though, with the, the two coin generators plus Miracle Salesman. You're probably laughing at that point. Uh, by the way, just as a, another note to the Portamans of Skylar, actually on the Taurus side of things, one of the slight weakness as well with big spell mage was there weren't actually enough big spell mages in my opinion to make the deck work you sort of want I, I think the sweet spot is five of the 30 cards in your deck are big spells four good ones we have with sunset volley times two 
and the tsunami times two and it was always trying to fit this final spot for me Potentially you could run this up to six. You probably can get away with four as well, but I think five would be the sweet spot. Uh, going into Rogue now, you actually have access to Snatch and Grab as well. There is a world where you do play eight cards from other classes before you scale and you swap your Snatch and Grab with your Tsunami to turn your Tsunami to a zero cost, Snatch and Grab back into a ten. And the nice thing about that is that you could then continue to discount your Snatch and Grab. That is so slow, I think it is just not a, a realistic outcome. And I also think Snatch and Grab as a cheating big spell, I don't think it's worth it really. I think it's actually a pretty weak big spell. You really want it to get discounted. It doesn't really fit in the theme with big spell mage. But just letting you know, you have access to this. If you were really desperate for minion destruction in your big spell mage deck, uh, Snatch and Grab is a potential option to put into your deck. Uh, so is the other new card, Huddle Up. Seven mana mage spell. Fill your board with random Naga. Okay, we have a new form of elemental inspiration, which is already in Mage, or a Razzle Dazzle effect, which funnily enough is also a Naga in itself. Uh, obviously, the quality of Huddle Up depends on the quality of the random Naga you're going to get. And I'll get to this onto the next page. Uh, elemental inspiration, though, and Razzle Dazzle required some form of setting up. You have to play spell schools uh, from different, sorry, spells from different spell schools to tune up the effect to make it much better. Uh, Huddle Up, you don't have to do that. You just innately fill your board with Naga, which is potentially nice if you're getting some good Naga. Here comes the, like, the problem of the, the spell, though. What is the average Naga you're going to get? And I'm just going to say now, I pulled this off Imic's page, though. All, you know, references go to Imic here. I've put his Twitch and YouTube on here as well with the HTTP for, you know, full, <laughs> full, uh, full web page identity. Uh, he did the maths on this before I could do it, and th this was while I was on holiday, by the way, so I literally didn't have any chance to do this. He worked out that the average Naga in the game is a 2.53. So, generally speaking, Huddle Up is going to get you something around like a 1721 worth of stat lines, which is obviously pretty good for 7 mana, but it's not like absolutely crazy. Also, it splits it quite wide, and there's a lot of ways to do like 3 AoE I say lots of ways. There's always do like three AOE damage in Hearthstone right now, which could just, you know, like destroy your huddle up. Just as like actual like knowledge of this as well. I think the highest high roll is Mantle Shaper. So a 5-5 five five is like your highest high roll. And I think your lowest low rolls are like one ones. There are a few other Nagas in there, with, like Vicious Slitherspeak, which you could argue might be better. Well, assuming you put Huddle Up in your Big Spell Mage, and I think that's the only place you would put this card is in Big Spell Mage. Uh, you're probably not playing multiple spells per turn to like you know, trigger your Vicious Slow Despair, or some of your other Nagas that like you to cast spells, so I actually think Huddle Up is slightly on the weaker side of cards, but maybe see some play just because of the fact it is a big spell. Because as I said, Sunset Volley, Tsunami, great big spells. What are your other options? Galactic Projection Orb. It can be good as long as you play a Sunset Volley or a Tsunami before you play the Galactic Projection Orb, otherwise the Galactic Projection Orb is pretty bad. Uh, you can play a Yogg in the box, but obviously you're going to be putting minions in your big spell mage deck, which means you don't know the quality of the five random spells. You might get less than eight mana worth of spells. Also, Yogg could, you know, be mean to you. And as I said, you could put Snatch and Grab into the deck now. Maybe Huddle Up, though, makes the list. I think I would consider running it as a one-off to fill up to five, as I said. I think that's probably around the quality of the card, but it's definitely, like, Tsunami, power quality, this high on, like, cheating it. Sunset Volley, drop down, and I think Huddle Up is like considerably weaker than that. I actually think you could come back from playing the uh, the 5 mana Skylar into a 0 mana Huddle Up. I think that is conceivable to come back from. I don't think that's 90% win rate territory, but it's still really, really good. The final mage card is Burn Down. 3 mana Fire spell, draw 3 cards and light them on fire. In 3 turns, any still in your hand are destroyed. Uh, it's basically a baby between Immolate and the Solarium. Uh, emulate used to burn your opponent's cards and in three turns they would destroy them instead you draw the three cards and you burn your own cards instead drawing three cards that are sort of temporary is very similar to the solarium which was a one mana shadow spell in warlock i will say the solarium had some other advantages over you know a lot of the other classes in the fact that they generated temporary cards which only lasted for one turn that's the downside compared to the fire effect However, Warlock has a discard synergy, and when temporary cards leave your hand, the counter is being discarded. So you'd play Solarium in some sort of discard Warlock deck, so you'd get some additional advantages. Along with potentially drawing a card and playing a card, you might get the discard effects off as well. 
Burn down obviously doesn't have that effect. I don't think there's any synergy in the existence of Hearthstone to do with lighting your cards on fire. Uh, but on, like, you know, just the base of the card, three mana draw three cards is pretty good. As long as you run a fairly low curve, you've got a decent chance to be able to cast off the three spells, like one turn after another, before they get burnt. Now, the problem I've got with this card is that Mage has really good draw cards. Like, if Mage has one good thing right now, it's drawing cards. They're really good at it. And it kind of sits in the same region of volume up, which is four mana draw, three spells. So you get to tutor for the cards as well. Uh, it's a pretty soft tutor, but it's still a tutor. But also if you finale this, and it's not too hard to finale volume up normally in Mage, which generates all of random value, you can get four mana draw, four spells without burning your cards. So I think volume up is just better than burn down as a general hand wavy rule of thumb. Similarly in no minion mage aka spell mage manufacturing error exists which is again five mana draw three cards but you can potentially get nine mana discount on that at the very least you're going to get three mana discount assuming you know there are cards in your deck to draw which i think generally means that manufacturing error in the deck that it exists in is going to be better than burn down and this got me thinking where where would you put burn down and to answer the question, I actually just don't know. If you run into this Mr. Vista Druid Mage deck, they don't normally run too many draw cards because they use the Choose Thrice card. Uh, is it called Sleep Under the Stars? Which has draw in the Thrice option and typically results in you filling your hand up after you Mr. Vista. It's not very convenient for Rayla because it's a three mana spell, doesn't trigger Rayla's effect, which is pretty inconvenient. Then I got thinking about Sith Mage, and Sith Mage doesn't really have many good fire spells right now for the deck. The problem with Sith Mage, though, is if you draw Sith via Burn Down, you're at a pretty bad timer, because if you burn Sith in your hand, you lose. So I think it is just too, like, it's too dangerous to put it into that deck. Even though the Sith Mage, as I understand it right now, only runs Flame Geyser as the fire spell in their deck. And I'm sort of crying out for a good fire spell to put into that deck. Uh, they, they just have to make do with that. Now, I will also say on this aspect of it, that deck also runs Wisdom of Norganin, which can get to zero mana draw two cards, which arguably is better than Burn Down in that deck. And similarly, I think that deck right now is running Rayla in the deck as well to get you access to a holy spell. And Wisdom of Norganin triggers with Rayla, which triggers with the Paladin spells, which triggers with Sif. I just don't see a world where you play Burn Down in any of these decks. So I think this card, I think this card would see play in a lot of other classes. I just don't think you'll see any play in Mage. All right, we get to Rogueland. Four mana spell, sharp shipment. Give your weapon plus two plus two. <laughs> Four mana, give your weapon plus two plus two. Way back in the past, Warrior had upgrade, which was one mana, give your weapon plus one plus one. And if you didn't have a weapon, it gave you a weapon. This card's terrible, right? Okay, actually, I don't think this card is terrible. I do think it's a little bit... I think it's a little bit weak. I don't think it's going to see some play, but there are some, like, niche spooky things that might come from this. Uh, one of the first things that you're always tempted to do on this is to see how you can break Rogue. Rogue has access to a lot of weapons. I just showed Spectral Cutlass here for an example as some sort of value-based deck. In your value-based deck, you might put Sandbox Scoundrel. You might put Sonya in your deck. If you Sandbox Scoundrel your Sharp Shipment, your Sonya can dance it and give you one mana get four attack on your weapon and four health on your weapon. Do I think this is all pretty good as a combo? No, I think it's too, much, too many hoops to jump through. One thing worth noting about, though, the the mana cost versus the amount of stats you get on your weapon is you're kind of getting multiplicatively more value by giving it more and more stats. If you gave, like, your Spectral Cutlass plus 4 plus 4, it means your weapon has the theoretical damage output to 36 damage. Now, it is over 6 turns, but it's theoretically your weapon contains lethal within the weapon. And if you remember, like, a lot of the decks that ran Ignis... Ignis would often generate you a ginormous weapon with like Wind Fury, summon a guy, and just Wind Fury weapon with like six health on it. Sometimes would just break down people. They would just die to that as they have no answer to the weapon. So I, I think it's kind of fair that it's more expensively costed. There are actually other reasons why I think this is expensively costed, but I, I think the hoops of jumping through for Sandbox Scoundrel to give you a one cost sharp shipment to Sonya Water Dancer, I think that it's just too, it's too fair. It's not cheaty enough. Uh, it's also pretty nice, that, by the way, you don't have to just put this in Spectral Cultures. The nice thing about Spectral Cultures is you would also get the Lifesteal on top of the additional stats, uh, which is like healing you back up, which kind of like makes up for the tempo loss during the process. 
You could just put this onto like Quick Pick, for example, to get you more draws. Uh, there's also the, the pirate weapon as well that generates you pirates. So there are actually quite a lot of good weapons in Rogue that you would like to put a bit more durability onto them. But I think that is kind of like the, where the nature comes from the card for Rogue side of things. You're kind of more interested in the durability, I think, than the attack. The attack would be nice, but... I think this might be a little bit too expensive. Where it might not be too expensive, though, is in Mage, weirdly. Mage has a weapon. They have Cosmic Keyboard. And boy, would that deck quite like to get more value from Cosmic Keyboard. It's such a disgusting play, even now. And it's not particularly strong Mage right now. But if you have a Cosmic Keyboard into volume up, and, you know, you draw four cards, you get a 4-4, it was just a huge amount of, like, refill a bit of tempo it's really scary that like every time you know you cast a spell you get a a standard minion on top of it if you cosmic keyboard into your sharp shipment you get a 4-4 on top of the sharp shipment effect and you're extending your cosmic keyboard by two turns also giving you the the ability if you wanted to to actually do two damage with the keyboard if you're like desperate for two damage you'd have that other option so giving yourself more options is actually pretty nice as well i legitimately think this could be a thing by the way you might run this really spell heavy deck with a cosmic keyboard in it and you put sharp shipment in the deck just to give yourself a bit more durability on the keyboard to give you more value for your spells in your deck you may also be tempted to try and put this into with like swarthy sword shine because you don't have access to it via the mage new tourist uh, that could potentially set your cosmic keyboard up to be you know another three durability if you let your keyboard drop down to one you play your swarthy sword shiner you're getting two durability on the uh, the weapon and you potentially could keep this cosmic keyboard going up for an, an entire game really with like short sharp shipment with swarthy and with a few other minions potentially is that good enough uh i'm not sure maybe you would consider teching sharp shipment in i say teching it maybe you'll try it in your your minionless mage deck to make your cosmic keyboard just go a little bit further i don't know if it's worth putting swarthy into the deck it becomes a little bit a little bit more awkward because you have to time the ability to play spells to reduce it to one to play the swarthy it might just be a few too many moving parts uh, i'm also not sure it will see play on the paladin side of things and i think this is kind of where they have to be really careful with the weapon though would you run this deck in hand buff paladin to give your painter's virtue another two swings and also give you another uh sorry this gives you six damage right now if you turn it into a five Sorry, a 4-5, you're getting 20 damage out of the weapon. Also with lifesteal as well, so it's pretty good sustain on top of that. The problem is that deck is so like reluctant to run anything that's not a minion in the deck that I don't think they'd run Sharp Shipment. And I think if they would have run Sharp Shipment, they would have run Swarthy in the deck and they would have run the Taurus in that deck just for Swarthy. I just don't don't think that the, the Hand of Tal Paladin actually needs more swings of the paint, paint of Virtue right now. I think the card, though, that maybe scared the dev team a little bit was horn of the wind lord because obviously you get even more advantages from your plus attack if your weapon has wind fury and if this was you know let's say a two mana spell which i think would actually be too strong potentially you would have eight mana horn which would do 10 damage every single turn as like burst damage intervals and i think that might be a bit too much so i think this card is on the weaker side of things but not inconceivable to see some play uh agency espionage another rogue spell four mana shuffle a card from each other class into your deck they cost one obviously this is a nod, nod back to academic espionage which shuffle 10 cards from your opponent's class into your deck they cost one quick maths there are 11 classes in hearthstone you're the rogue so you're not going to get any rogue cards from your agency espionage which means you're going to get 10 cards so it's exactly the same as academic espionage just you don't get them all from your opponent's class you get them one from each class funny thing about this card is i don't know if Pass don't intend to ever add another class to the game to round it up to 12. Uh, if they do, Agency Espionage gets one better than Academic Espionage, which I, I think is quite funny. Uh, just off the bat, I think this card will see zero play. Mainly because Sky Mother Aviana exists in the game right now. It is in Druid, not in Rogue. That shuffles 10 legendary minions into the deck, and they cost one for one more mana, and you get a 5 5 on top of it. This card basically sees zero play, and the only instance where this did see play was as a tech card versus stuff like Bomb Warrior, which shuffled cards into your deck to dilute the bombs in your deck and give you a few more, like, fodder cards that could get hit by the bombs. So there is a world where Agency Espionage sees some play as a tech card against something like a Bomb Warrior or a Plague Death Knight, maybe, or some other class that shuffles stuff into your deck. Just off, you know, the card 
merit on its own right. Obviously, it has some advantage with Sonya Water Dancer. The cards that you get generated and put into your deck cost one, which means you can Water Dance them. So if you get a really good one cost card, you can Sonya it to get a zero cost and even more value. I'm here to tell you though, Value Rogue very rarely works. It kind of has to generate like disgusting levels of value, or at least it has to be more refined than just random cards from other classes. Like you're going to get hit some really bad cards with Agency Espionage that simply are going to be dead cards in your deck and they will just not be playable. Uh, one thing you might want to do though with your Agency Espionage if you're going to try to make it work into your deck is put it into something like a Cycle Rogue type deck where you're... You're trying to fill your hand with a bunch of cards. You cycle your entire hand to draw a bunch of cards in your deck to get advantage from everything must go. And the, the golem whose name I've forgotten, which gets discounted for every card you've drawn this turn. And then you can kind of fill out your mana curve with these random one cost cards from other classes. And even if you don't get the most advantage of the one drops, even if they are like, you know, they are one mana three twos and stuff like that. It's fine because you would just be doing nothing else with the mana anyway, so... There are things you could do, but I just think they are, generally speaking, too weak. They are too random. And a bit like I always say, like, one in 12 games, you're going to get, like, an insane agency espionage, and the other 11 games, you're going to have sad times. Uh, worth noting as well, if you generate any spells via the agency espionage, it is cards, not spells. You could Linessa them, so potentially if you want to use your Paladin Rogue deck, maybe your own agency espionage into the deck, Fill your deck with a bunch of cards and try and draw through your deck. Maybe with something like Nick Nack Jack, which obviously can go into any of the rogue variants as well, which likes you to draw cheap cards. Agent of Espionage puts a bunch of cheap cards in your deck. Maybe allows you to Nick Nack Jack multiple times per turn. And if you draw spells, Linessa can duplicate them. But again, random spells, a bit hand wavy. Sometimes they're bad, sometimes they are good. Uh, similarly in Mageland, I don't think you'd probably run this into your mage rogue taurus deck i really think you have to run that in big spell mage to get an advantage off your taurus the agency espionage is like very anti uh, big spell mage synergy because you're putting cheap spells into your deck so you can't really cheat out your big spells from your deck because the likelihood is you're gonna have a one cost spell in your deck maybe you do run it as some sort of tempo orientated deck though with like stargazer luna which lets you draw multiple cards they keep going to the right side of your hand they cost one you play the card you get a one cost you play the card you get a one cost Add infinitum. Well, I say add infinitum until you know ten cards are being drawn. Maybe this is also the situation where you play burn down. Maybe it's in a completely different, unique deck. Uh, you burn down to draw a bunch of cards. They cost one, so you're more likely to play them before they get immolated. Uh, I think this won't work though because the Taurus doesn't really synergize with the rest of the deck. And actually, the card that really rewards you for playing multiple spells per turn is the Mage Paladin Taurus, which you can't put into this deck. I actually forgot to mention this in the first video. You can't play two Taurus in one deck. That has been confirmed. So you can't play the uh, Skylar and the Layla in the same deck. That is not something you can do. That is too much for the, the Hearthstone engine to handle. Uh, the final Rogue minion, I think it's getting slightly slept on. Uh, it's Robocaller, a 3-mana three 3-2 three, mech. Battlecry, draw an 8-8 eight, eight, and 8 cost card. Numbers dialed randomly each turn. Okay, let me explain how this card works because it's not immediately apparent. If you get Robocaller in your hand and you play it on the turn that is in your hand, you will draw from your deck three eight cost cards in your deck, assuming three eight cost cards are in your deck. After every single turn though, where you don't play this, the eight, eight and eight get randomized. And I think the number goes between zero and nine. You can never get a 10 drop via the Robocaller. You know, it tries to mimic a phone number I guess, like, the the first part, like, the location part of a phone number. So, on the next turn, you might get, you know, like, a 1, 2, 3. You might get a, a 1, 5, 5. You, you get the, the type of deal. It's three kind of randomly tutored cards. It's really weird in the fact that it's, like, a tutor, but it's sort of a random tutor. Uh, it reminds me somewhat of Juicy Psychomelon, which drew a 7, 8, 9, 10. Obviously, this didn't randomize, but it was 4 mana, draw 4 cards potentially, and shoot for very specifically a 7, 8, 9, and 10 cost minion. You normally didn't run multiple copies of 7, 8, 9, and 10 cost minions in your deck. Sometimes, and I think more often than not, you didn't run all 4 of the 7, 8, 9, and 10. You would run like 3 of them, you get 4 mana, draw 3 cards, and it's like 3 cards you needed for a combo. I think they saw a lot of play in like Aviana Druid decks, but I might be misremembering the, the past. Uh, either way, you know, four mana draw, three cards that are tutored. Wasn't that bad in the past. Actually, it wouldn't be that bad now either. We do have stuff like All You Can Eat, which is three mana tutor for three cards, kind of. Uh, 
which actually isn't seen that much play, but it did see some play in Unkiliax Warrior before they nerfed that deck into the ground. Robocaller? You're getting three minions. Let's say minions. You're getting three cards. On top of the 3-2, that's really good. I think that is, like, actually solid. Now, obviously, sometimes it's going to roll, like, really poorly. You're not going to get the three cards. It might roll a nine-cost card, and you have no nine-cost in your deck. You might roll zero-cost, you have no zero-cost in your deck. Obviously, there are some weaknesses to that. But just generally speaking, if you play Robocaller just in Rogue, and you hit the 888, you could hit stuff like Snatch and Grab and Everything Must Go, which are two eight-cost spells that can actually get discounted to zero. What's important though, especially if you're playing cards from other classes on the snatch and grab side of things, is that it's eight costing your deck, but in your hand it's zero cost. So Robocall suddenly becomes a potential way to generate a a big tempo swing, right? You could play your three mana three two and then destroy four opponent cards with snatch and grab reduced to zero. That's pretty good going. Uh, obviously, you would need a little bit more uh machinations and working out with everything must go you'd probably have to cycle your deck a little bit more to get the everything must go down to zero but i do see a world where you play this robocaller in your cycle rogue type deck and maybe you cycle your deck you draw a bunch of cards you play a robocaller to draw you with like three more cards guarantee you get an everything must go and you play all your everything must goes in one big swoop you get a four four cost minions for zero and your three two that's really good. It does, as I said, require some setting up in generating a big hand, surviving, and then cycling it. But it, if you can do that, it's actually a big tempo swing. Again, going back to tourist types of things, Mage doesn't have too many 8-cost cards. In fact, they, I think they only have Caligos and Yogg in the Box, which is not very good with your Robocaller. Uh, Paladin, though, does have, actually have a pretty good outcome. Uh, I think the two big ones from Paladin are Tyrion and Prismatic Beam. But Prismatic Beam can also get reduced while it's in your hand. Potentially, you know, you Robocall, your Prismatic Beam. You also get your 8-cost Rogue cards as well. They all get significantly discounted and enable you to deal with your opponent's board at will. It kind of turns you into a control deck, which is very, very interesting. All the things that this card can potentially do and where it might be added... Any deck where it hasn't got a particularly good draw engine that currently exists might want to put the Robocaller in the, the deck. Perhaps you don't ever play this as the, and I think this is for the general speaking, you're not going to play this often for the 888. You're going to dial up for very specific cards. And maybe in your deck, you only have like one five drop in the deck. And as soon as it says draw like a a five and then, you know, two other numbers, you play and you pull out like a key card for your deck. So like Earthen Paladin, maybe you put, pull out a Disciple of Amethyst. Maybe you put no three drops in your Highlander Paladin deck, and if it ever dials three, you get your Spirit of the Badlands instantaneously. Obviously, you would actually have to put a three drop in that deck, being the Robocaller, but spoilers, the Robocaller would be on your hand at that point, so it would be two three drops, but you couldn't ever hit the Robocaller as you're a Highlander deck, so they're the only two three drops you have in your deck. Not completely crazy, I think. Uh, you could also put it maybe into, like, Mech Rogue. Mech Rogue often vomits out a lot of minions. They need a refill. This is both a Mech, it is a Rogue card, and it is refill. Maybe you don't care about the dialing too much, as long as it's somewhat on the, like, the cheaper side of things, for that uh, side of things, you're probably fine. And as long as you like drawing two cards, I think 3 mana 3 to draw two cards with a Mech tag in Mech Rogue would actually be acceptable. You may also then want to build your Mech Rogue deck slightly differently. Maybe you make it more mid-range so you cover more of the mana uh, costs so your Robocaller can call, you know, those numbers. Uh, finally, this card might see some play in Big Spell Mage. Funnily enough, I just showed this as like a token card. It can't ever dial Tsunami, which might actually be the reason why they changed Tsunami, which was a bit random at the time and felt like a bit of a nerf to the card. I think it was actually a nerf to the card overall before, you know, the new cards have been shown. I think it was to stop Robocaller calling for a Tsunami, maybe? Uh, but in just general for that deck, you might have your Robocaller wait for five and pull out a Siler from the deck, which is like a key, key card. Also, that deck would like to draw cards, and it's pretty hard to draw cards not using spells in Mage. Uh, this would be a really good minion for that deck. You can also have it try and get, like, the dream scenario is hits like a five and a nine cost spell, gives you Sunset Volley, gives you Skylar, and you're just ready, right? That is a perfect setup before turn five. You'd obviously need the coin as well, I guess. I, I guess you'd need the coin, but uh, some sort of cheap spell in your hand. You probably will have that by turn five. So I actually think Robocaller is going to see some play. I think this card is like getting sort of slept on a little bit. 
Uh, now we're going to Demon Hunter Land. We have Demonic Deal, two mana, fell spell, life steal, deal four damage to a minion, put a random demon that costs five or more on top of your deck. Uh, dealing four damage, life steal is normally something that Priest does, which is kind of funny because Demon Hunter can tourist into Priest. Uh, they've had Devouring Plague from the past, which was split along enemy minions, and was three mana. And Void Shard, which exists in standard and sees zero play. Uh, which also does 4 damage life steal, but it could go to the face where Demonic Deal can't. It is, though, a 2 mana discount on the Demonic Deal. Uh, I think this card, generally speaking, is pretty bad. <laughs> Can I be completely honest with you? It's merely the second part of the spell. Because if you're playing your Demonic Deal, like, on turn... Let's say you play this on curve. You play it on 2. Putting a demon that costs 5 more on top of your deck is basically giving you a dead draw at that point in the game so you sort of want to play demonic deal later into the game where i feel like the life steal gain for health and deal for them to a minion is less apt than at any other point in the game also there's not actually that many demons seen play currently in standard which sort of suggests the power level of demons is slightly weak just some examples of the five cost demons you might be able to get us and that are pretty good i think illidar inquisitor mag Theridon, sargarius would obviously be a really insane high roll uh, you could play these on like turn 10 with your Demonic Deal, you play your Mag Theridon, your Illidari, so I guarantee you'd probably have to wait another turn for it. Uh, no, you'd also, sorry, I'm, I'm talking nonsense, you'd have to wait another turn anyway, unless you drew the, the card. I, I just think, generally speaking, you're putting a roadblock on top of your deck that you just don't need. It rewards you for a value deck going into the late game. Value decks that go into the late game just don't see any play right now, so I think this card sees zero play. I think the intention of this is some sort of big demon, demon hunter deck, where you discount this demon with raging fell screamer and you try and like time it in such a way that you play your raging fell screamer you play your demonic deal and then you draw the big demon which gets a two mana discount and hopefully you play it for like six or something instead and it was an eight cost demon because i think a lot of the demons sit around the eight cost uh, range also you could umpire's grasp as well to try and draw that top demon in your deck if there were other demons in your deck though you might not hit it in which case you're just shuffling it into your deck which might be a good thing because you want this late into the game rather than sooner where demonic deal you know it's a low mana co cost card so you'd want to play it sooner i i just i don't see the vision i think the vision though was actually that you would play this with like narain and twilight medium it, it's just it, it's too much moving parts right Especially if you wanted to play all three on the same turn, because that is 11 mana immediately, and you couldn't play the Fortunes because they would be one mana spells, uh, minion, sorry. So you'd need a lot of mana cheat to make this three card combo work. And at the end of the day, you're getting a random demon, and there are some pretty weak random demons that cost five or more. Uh, Doomguard would be a really bad pull for this, because you typically don't only discard two cards in your hand. So, yeah. I, I think it's a bit hand wavy, this card. I think it is random value and random value is typically not good the pool of demons is too big you know I, I just don't think it would work maybe though if you do try to make some sort of value demon hunter priest deck work i could see a world where you play your demonic deal and just twilight medium and hope that you get like a seven or an eight mana discount on a big demon which is a big tempo swing for the the most part i will say though they added another big good demon to the the game spirit peddler six mana six six demon rush death rattle Reduce the cost of a random minion in your hand by six. Uh, that's really insane. If you hit a random minion and get a six mana discount on it, that's crazy. It kind of treats this as like, you know, zero mana deals six damage. It's not quite the way that works, but uh, it's kind of like that. The problem with this card, it's kind of getting back to the part one, is that you're probably going to have to bastardize your deck to some degree because you really want to get as much of the six mana discount on this card as possible. I think around 6 mana, you're probably hoping to have 14, 14, 14, 14 that would be insane, 14 uh, stats worth at the, like a bare minimum to be a good card in standard. It depends on the effect of the card, of course, but you're kind of looking at that ballpark. So you're playing, I think, an understated, definitely an understated 6 drop for the cost. So you want a pretty decent discount on the card that is coming in your hand, because again, you're getting this value later on, and you typically want value and like any cheat you want it as fast as possible and this is a little bit slower i will say you don't have to like completely destroy your deck as you need to do for like bungar if you hit something and reduce it by four instead i think that is acceptable i think if you hit a three drop you'd be like we're just like we're wiping our feet on this deal i think less than that you've probably got a pretty weak deal 
Uh, there are some support for big packages though. There is Cliff Dive currently existing in Demon Hunter. Potentially try and cheat out your Spirit Pedal. Your Spirit Peddler rushes into an opponent minion, kills itself, and then discounts a card in your hand by six. And then you get, rather than the temporary card from the Cliff Dive, you get a permanent card because you play the six discounted minion from your hand. I, I think that is, you know, I think that is a bit too much of a pipe dream though. What I will say though is Window Shopper Demon Hunter, which was a pretty good deck going into this expansion, Got heavily nerfed though just going into it. So it wasn't like a tier one deck as we went into the uh the current expansion. This is a really good demon to pull out with Window Shopper though. Because if you pull Spirit Pedal out as the base form, you're getting a five mana six five. So you're getting one mana cheaper. And this card really is its effect. That is the power part of this card, is the effect of the card. So you're sort of playing a, like a minus one mana card. It doesn't quite work that way because again, slow value versus fast value. Well, as long as your minion dies, you get the six mana discount. Where it's insane, though, is on the mini. Because the mini is one mana, one, one, discount for six. And it's pretty easy to kill a one, one versus a six, six or a six, five. So you're almost certainly going to get this discount on a minion in your deck. So maybe you run this as sort of like a, a more heavy, like mid to late range type of deck. You have a bunch of chunky guys in your deck. You accept the Spirit Pedal will sometimes be hit four or five drops, but that's fine. It's still a lot of potential mana discount on your Window Shopper into Spirit Pedal at play. Also, being a, de a demon, you could discount this with Umpire's Grass. So maybe you do your Window Shopper Demon Hunter deck with a Spirit Pedal in there as well. And the Spirit Pedal can potentially do a six mana discount on your Window Shopper, turn that into a zero cost card. You Window Shopper, try and get a Spirit Pedal. You get the idea. You Maybe you can cycle it. Part of the other reason, by the way, that why Window Shopper got worse, though, was that there were a lot more bad demons added to the game. So I don't know how much the entire pool of demons uh, is, like, worsened right now versus, like, the addition of Spirit Peddler and sort of, like, Magtheron in that pool. Uh, maybe this doesn't quite work. I think this is something that we'll have to see some testing. Uh, finally, actually, the other thing this card has got going for it is this card, Return Policy, which I actually didn't know existed. I simply forgot about this card. It wants a good Death Rattle Demon Hunter deck. It doesn't really exist, but this is actually an insane death rattle to copy with return policy. It's it's basically three mana, get a decent card, discount something by six. I think the way this works is potentially if you had no card in your hand, you would discover the spirit peddler, and then I think it would trigger its own death rattle and reduce it to a zero cost card. So return policy would become three mana generate a six six that discounts another minion by six in your hand which seems like a lot of mana cheating so i actually think there might be some sort of deck here i don't know if it get well it definitely doesn't go into tier one i don't know if it'd make tier two but i think there's something fun here with like some sort of big big demony demon hunter type deck or just a big deck full stop uh, as i alluded to before as well if you're going to be running big cards maybe you want to put bungar in your deck I think it's a real Bungar in the, this deck versus being a Dungar in some of the other decks because there's not a lot of ways for Demon Hunter to like resurrect and bring stuff back. That being said though, you can put this into Priest, which means you can get the resurrect card from Priest, but obviously that hits the highest cost card in your deck and Dungar is pretty heavily costed. So that is a pretty big disadvantage. And in fact, I think you would struggle to put a 10 cost card into your deck that you would always pull back with Dungar. That being said, Dungar would also reward your card having a fast action effect. And Spirit Peddler does have a fast action effect by the fact that it has Rush. And if you rushed and killed this on the Dungar turn, you could reduce the cost of random minion in your hand, which might be one of the patches you drew before you got to Dungar it in your hand. It's probably going to be a big minion, which means you'll get the full use of the discount. And maybe you play that on a future turn. So I think there is some like merit in this, but I think there are better cards to put into that big deck than Dungar. Uh, also for Demon Hunter Land, they have Infernal Stapler, a new weapon. Three mana, three, uh, three. After your hero attacks, deal three damage to your hero. Uh, really good card. Very good for the pain archetype, which is more on the pre side of things. Clearly, it's made with Arana Thrillseeker in mind, which is a deck that isn't seeing too much play. In fact, I think it's seeing basically no play right now. Uh, the idea of this deck, though, is that you would play Arana, you'd play a bunch of these self-damaging cards, which a weapon is very good at anyway, because you can already hit an opponent minion to trigger the damage from the opponent minion, as well as the effect of this card doing three more damage to your uh, face. So it depends on what you hit, obviously, with Arana on the field and this weapon. You might get, like, 
deal three damage to a minion, take three damage, and then maybe if that minion was like a three three, for example, you do six to random enemies on your opponent's side of things with the Arana, which is a pretty good combo. You'd almost certainly put this into the priest package as well, because most of the payoff cards are actually in priest rather than in demon hunter, and in which case you could use rest in peace to keep cheating out Aranas for the most part. Uh, it's also really good with something like Sauna Regular, if you are running this in Demon Hunter preset type of uh, decks, because this is two triggers for the Sauna Regular. The one of the disadvantages of Sauna Regular versus a lot of the other pain payoff cards that exist in like Warlock, for example, is that they look at the raw damage that you take. Sauna Regular wants you to take instances of damage, but Infernal Stapler hitting a minion, I believe is two separate instances of damage, which means that every swing into a minion reduces Sauna Regular by two mana instead of just one versus a lot of the other cards. So I think that's actually a pretty powerful card that really does push this Demon Hunter Priest archetype. Fully enough though, one of the things I said that I think this deck was missing, and I still think is missing, is Lifesteal. The real disadvantage right now versus, you know, just playing pure Pain Priest versus Pain Demon Hunter Priest is that Demon Hunter struggles to lifesteal right now. They don't have a lot of great ways to stabilize and heal, which Pain Warlock has a lot of. And actually, Pain Priest can do some stabilization. They do have some healing in Priest, funnily enough. Demonic Deal offers potential that lifesteal. So I was like, oh, this is going to be a really good combo. But then I thought about it and I was like, hang on a minute. Putting a demon that costs five or more on top of your deck is a really bad card with a Rana and Rest in Peace. Because typically you want to put a Rana back with your Rest in Peace. With Demonic Deal, you're going to be putting something in that is more expensive than a Rana, which means that Rest in Peace will hit that instead. So I actually think... Pardon me, this card is anti-synergistic with the deck that it wants to be put in. So uh, kind of a, a rough deal on that. But maybe you just have to accept that you get some value from a Rana and eventually you get value in rest and peace on just some random big demon instead. I think that's a pretty bad deal though, but uh, yeah, I still think that deck is going to struggle. All right, now we get to Priestland. We have Envoy of Prosperity, two mana, four, four. Battlecry, put the highest cost card in your hand on top of your deck. Very similar to some Demon Hunter cards from the past, Dispose of Evidence and Bibliomite. Probably close to Bibliomite since it's a minion. Uh, both these cards went minus two in terms of hand size as you would not only just play the card, you would also have to choose a card in your hand and put it into your deck. One key thing about both these cards is it got shuffled into the deck, it didn't go into the top of the deck. So, potential with Envoy of Prosperity, if you're running a low enough curve, you might put on top of your deck a three cost minion, in which case you draw it and can play it on the next turn, which would be pretty good for your curve, so to speak. You're still going minus one card, which is a really big, big payment for a card you do get the advantage of you're getting 8-8 eight, eight stats on 2 which is disgusting obviously the average stat you'll get is like 5 stats on 2 so you're getting a lot of bang for your buck that being said you're not getting as much as Bibliomite that was a 5-4 and I think it makes a huge difference like 5 damage each turn means that you know in 6 swings with a minion the opponent is going to die with Envoy it is more than 6 so I, I think it's a pretty big deal the the stat change there are some meany plays as well you could do with Twilight Medium and the Rain. I think this kind of like nodded to these cards. Again, I think this is just simply too slow. It's too many moving parts. You don't want to play Envoy of Prosperity into a Twilight Medium into discounting a big minion to one. It's just not worth it because you're losing so much like potential value of playing an early eight stat minion on two. Instead, you're playing like seven mana worth of stuff for eight nine of stats which is way easier to deal with on like turn seven than it would have been like four that's right eight stats on two i i just i don't see that being a realistic thing so where i see this seeing some play potentially is some sort of aggro priest probably demon hunter deck let's be real because demon hunter is really good at refilling your hands and you just accept that you go minus two cards on this and eventually one of the demon hunter insane draw cards refills your hand and you just keep smoking your opponent's face i think this will be some sort of zoo demon hunter priest deck Maybe that will work, though. Uh, and it actually doesn't fit too insanely in with the the Arana take self-damage, because you can also do that with Fatigue. So if you can draw through your entire deck and be aggressive in the process, maybe Envoy of Prosperity is like a card they need to put that early game pressure on, lower your opponent's health total, so that Arana can then kill them from it there. I don't think that's actually crazy. I think that might be some sort of valid deck, but I don't see anything with, like... I don't think Envoy will see play with Twilight Medium. Uh, then we have Job Shadower, 3 mana, 4, 3, Undead, Battlecry. If your hero took damage this turn, summon a copy of this. Uh, potentially insane card. It gives me 
Memories of Partner in Crime, back from Nathri, I think this was, which was a 4 mana 2 5 that had a Battlecry and summon a copy of this at the end of your turn. The big thing about Partner in Crime, though, was that you could hand buff and board buff this card to get insane stats on this card. It's basically doubling the hand buff or the, the board buff effects. Job Shadow is a little bit more awkward in the fact that you would have to do it as a hand buff and not a, a board buff, but actually currently Priest is a lot better at hand buffing than board buffing, I think. Uh, and also for this job shadow, its effect is pretty easy to get off. Obviously, Pain Priest package has stuff like Night JT and it has Brain Masseuse. Both of these things, especially a Brain Masseuse, I think this would be the, the real dream. If you get a Brain Masseuse to live into turn three and you attack with your Brain Masseuse, you take some self damage. Hopefully, you put it into a minion, of course, so that you do actually take the self damage. Then on turn three, you're playing 8 6 in stats, which is really disgusting. I mentioned. Turn 2, 8-8 eight, eight was disgusting. 14 stats on 3, also disgusting. Now, you might say there's some temptation to throw this in your Demon Hunter Priest deck, because then you could also put some weapons from Demon Hunter, like Quick Pick, into your deck. And that would probably be the most reliable way of doing it, is swinging with a weapon on turn 3 into a minion, taking some self-damage from the weapon, and playing your Job Shadower. I will say, though, you lose out on a lot of value that is just existing in Priest if you do this. And I actually think you'll only see this in Pain Priest package rather than the, the Demon Hunter Priest package. I might be wrong on this one, but there's certainly some extra value you can get, namely in the form of Power Code Synchronize. If you hit this with Power Code Synchronize, it's actually really disgusting. You're probably not going to be doing this on turn three, let's be real here. But assuming one of your Job Shadows lives, and it's a pretty decent chance if you're on turn three, you're playing eight, six of stats, that one of them is going to live. And on the next turn, you synchronize it and get the finale effect off on it, which is pretty easy because you can just push the button to do it to give you that extra two mana. Then in your hand, you have a 5-5 five five that requires you to take damage on your turn and will duplicate itself. That basically turns out into three mana 10 10 of stats, which is obviously insanely, insanely disgusting. So I actually see this more on the Pain Priest side of things. And Pain Priest normally Taurus into Hunter. Hunter fans rejoice. I think some of your cards might see play. Bird watching, really good with Job Shadow. If you can play a bird watching on two, it does kind of require again Brain Masseuse to live through one and two. Uh, you turn this into a six four and you duplicate it. That is twelve eight of stats. That's twenty stats on turn three. And I don't care what deck you are, that is going to cause you some problems. So I, I actually can see that working. And actually, Hunter does have another weapon. Unfortunately, it's a three cost weapon, which makes it harder to weave it into the the order of play. But if you can maybe wait one more turn and play some four instead for some big stats, which actually would still be really good if you're getting 20 stats on turn four, you could use Trusting Frishing Rod to proc the effect of Job Shadow, which is more consistent probably than the Brain Masseuse and hoping that it lives onto that turn. Uh, so yeah, I think that is actually not an insane package. Now, my slight hesitations of this card is that this card, Bumbling Bellhop, exists currently in standard. It actually was added to this set. I thought this card was going to be insane. It's actually seeing basically zero play right now. It's probably easier, generally, to take hero damage than it is to have a five-cost spell in your hand by turn three. It's a bit hand wave. I will say, like, the hardest class to probably do that in the take damage to your hero is Priest. So, it has that going against it. But it, generally speaking, is not too bad, especially when you can tour it into Hunter or Demon Hunter, which can both do it fairly easily. This is three mana for six, six of stats with taunt. Slightly less stats, but you get another effect on top of it. This card is seeing zero play, which makes me think that the quality of this card is just not quite going to be high enough. I think it might just be a little bit too, too fair, I suppose. And I went like, I was thinking about it. If you do wait till turn four, you're competing with stuff like Crazed Conductor, which can potentially in the Insanity Warlock deck, vomit out a lot of stats. So, I think this potentially is really good, but I'm just not sure it's going to be better than what exists in Tier 1. I actually think this Pain Priest deck, though, might actually sit somewhere fairly consistently into Tier 2 now, though. I do think it's, like, I think this package now is actually good enough to exist. Whereas before, it felt like it was missing a few things. I just don't think it's going to quite see the highest highs of some of the other uh, sets. The final card in Priest is Silver Moon Brochure, which is the Brochure effect which flips every single turn. That can flip into Gilneas, Brochure. They're both two mana spells. Uh, Silver Moon is holy and has give a minion immune and, sorry, give a minion immune this turn and plus two plus two. Gilneas side of things is shadow and silence the minion and gives it minus two, minus two. Uh, I generally speaking think this card is pretty weak. The Silver Moon side of things is actually pretty similar to Ramming Mount. 
Uh, Ramming Mount gave a minion plus two, plus two, and immune for three. However, it generated a ram when it died, and I think the ram also was immune while attacking. Either way, you got some additional like statage on top of this card, so I think the quality is somewhat similar. However, Hunter is way better at like you know swarming the board with minions and then buffing them like some sort of like Zooey tokeny deck than Paladin is. And Paladin doesn't have too many decks. Paladin Priest doesn't have too many decks right now that can do that. Paladin does actually. This might be Cease of Blade Paladin, but I don't think you will in Priest. Uh, fully enough, that actually the combination of these brochures and similar to this immune effect, it's actually pretty similar to like an Attorney at More effect, which I think was from the mini set More and Order. Which was a two mana one three druid minion, which had choose one and one of its effects was silence a card, and the other one was given minion immune. You didn't get the stats on it, but you did get the stats on the minion itself. So they're actually not too dissimilar. And actually, turning it more saw a little bit of play because of the silence side of things, I believe, because uh, there was stuff that needed silencing in the game. Uh, Gilgamesh side of things, silencing a card is a zero mana effect. Typically, if you want to do a bit of extra damage on top of it, currently existing standard is deafen. One mana, silence a minion, combo deal two damage. It's pretty easy to combo it. It kind of fits in with like the, the valuation of the Gilneas brochure. That is two mana, and instead of just getting like the two damage, you also lose the two attack on the minion as well. Overall, on these cards, I just think they're both too fair. And I don't think there's any deck that really exists in there. And actually, I think the cards are too contrasting in what they do. Silver and brochure probably really rewards you in like a minion v minion trading uh, match off. Where you give one of your minions immune on a turn, you trade into opponents when your guy survives, your opponents doesn't, which gives you that tempo advantage. The problem is that the Gilnius side of things then is silence a card which is more of a controly type aspect of a card. It doesn't really give you too much tempo. Sure, the minus two minus two might kill a guy, but it also might not. So I just think the they're not quite gelling well enough the two brochures. Again, you can't reliably get one side or the other. Unless you like shoot her specifically for a brochure to draw it because you obviously start with Silvermoon every single time. I just, I think it doesn't work. I think it's just simply too weak. And compared to what other cards Priest is going to be doing right now, I just, I just don't see it. And by the way, actually, for the Pain Priest package, which is probably their more Zooey package, you don't really want to give your Pain cards immune because you want them to take damage to proc your immune to proc your pain effect so it's actually anti-synergistic with that deck so maybe it's a one to watch out for maybe there is some sort of zooey priest deck that comes from this that really wants the immune effect but i couldn't think of anything immediately off the bat uh we're now going to go into a few like random cards we've not got a full druid package yet at least as i record this uh we were shown though the ungoro brochure and the dalaran brochure this is the br brochure for druid they're both four mana spells one is a nature spell that draws two minions, give them plus two, plus two. And the other side is draw two spells. They cost one less. Uh, I think this card, again, is a little bit just too fair. Ungoro can be combined, uh, combined, compared a little bit to Take to the Skies, which is a three mana draw two dragons. You only get plus one, plus one, though. So for one mana less, you lose out on two, two stats. However... You do tutor more specifically. Rather than just getting minions, you're getting dragons. And dragons and druid right now are really insane. So I think Take to the Skies is better than the Ungoro brochure if they both just existed in their own right. Uh, but maybe the Dalian brochure side of things makes things a little bit better. And actually, when I, I compare this to other like draw two discount cards like Summer Flower Child or Lifebinder's Gift, especially if you can hit both the choose effects, which is possible in druid, where you get two random nature spells and discount all spells in your hand by one. I just think there are more cheaty things you can do with other cards within Druid. Uh, and actually, when you actually evaluate this card, what do I value drawing two cards as? It's probably in standard right now about a two minor effect. On the brochure side of things, getting four, four hand buff stats, I think it's worth around three mana ish. So I'd probably say Ungoro Brochure is discounting you like a mana ish. It's actually more than that because combining the two cards is better than them being individual. Uh, down on brochure side of things, drawing two cards, I'd probably say is, you know, a the two mana effect as i said before discounting two cards by two is sort of like a, a minus two type effect so it doesn't quite work that way because again you're combining the effects I, I think roughly speaking on both sides of things you get about about a one mana discount ish i'd probably say you get a little bit more discount on the, the ungoro brochure but i think neither are good as like take to the skies life binders gift or summer flower child so i think these won't see any play i just think there are better draw options in druid and there's possibly some better discount options the only thing i'll say is if there's ever a combo deck that exists out there that needs like a fairly unspecific discount on a spell maybe Della and brochure see some place that you can potentially discount a spell via the brochure i, I just don't see it though uh, then we get to Employee of the Month. Get it? Employee? It's a pun. 
A two mana three two demon battle cry. Give a friendly minion life steal. Uh, this won't see any play. This is just fodder. Fanboy exists currently in standard. It sees zero play. Arguably, is better than employee of the month because you get more stats. Also, it's a bit more flexible in the fact that you can get rush and attack or health and life steal. I will say though, obviously. Warlock is a class that really does like healing because they have pain and insanity packages which require you to take damage. Obviously though, the insanity decks do this by other means. They don't normally life steal, they normally mitigate damage to the face via, you know, the harp or something like that. It's just some way to give yourself immune for a time being. In which case you're effectively getting like more healing off on the not taking damage from multiple turn type things. Because uh, the insanity decks can start doing, you know, like five fatigue damage to your face some of the minions in the pain package can just do five damage to the face that type of thing so it's just not worth giving a minion life steal it's just better to not take damage to begin with so i think employee of the month has basically zero percent chance to see any form of play also giving a minion something that isn't a fast acting effect is normally pretty weak so giving something like life steal hell even giving something wind fury which i know can actually lead to some pretty destructive situations if a minion can live on the board uh, it's normally a, a little bit weaker than just giving something rush, for example, so they can actually, you know, trade more easily. So, uh, I, I just don't see it. The final card we're going to go through today, which is actually the card that was released this morning as I record this, is Canav Canaveris Cubicle. It's back, baby. It's Canaveris Cube. Uh, it's a 5 mana 4 6 battle cry, destroy a friendly minion, summon a copy of it at the end of your turns. Obviously, this is a nod back to kind of. Potentially most beloved slash hated cards printed in Hearthstone. It basically made the deck form around it, Q-Block. Back, I can't remember exactly when Q-Block even was, but it was back when they released the Frozen Throne. Thre Frozen Throne, because it had stuff like the uh, Gul'dan Death Knight in the deck. The idea of it was that you would cube stuff like Void Lord and you'd cube stuff like Doom Guard. And eventually you would trigger your own death rattle. You would have its death rattle triggered. You'd get tons of cheating stats. You had a Void Lord, which was really sticky. You'd have Doom Guard, which would charge to the face. And you'd do disgusting damage with it. More to the point as well, while you're destroying these demons, which by the way would have been cheated out with like Skull of Minari. Uh, you'd also have Blood Reaver Gul'dan in the deck, which would summon all the demons that died during the game. And you would hopefully get a board full of Doom Guards and Void Lords. And ideally not the, the one three demons with taunts. And that is such a big value smorgasbord of stuff that... You would typically just grind your opponent down in some way and actually sometimes just burst people down with doom guards and actually the blood reaver go down button could also then do some extra damage along the way it was a pretty destructive deck as i said it became known as q block and this was a pretty key card in making that deck happen now comparing this to carnivorous cubicle there are some things that cubicle has going for it there are some things it's got going against it and actually, I'll talk about this as we go through, but I think Carnivorous Cube is just better than Carnivorous Cubicle. I think it's actually a, a weaker version of the card. Carnivorous Cubicle is obviously more advantageous if you can keep it alive for like three turns or more, because then you're getting three minions versus the Cubicle, which, sorry, the Cube, which could only give you two at a max. However, as I said, you have to keep it alive. If you don't keep it alive, Cubicle might only give you one minion, which is worse than Carnivorous Cube. And by and large, you want to get two copies from the death rattle or two more copies of the card from your cubicle or cube because if you don't you're basically playing ravenous kraken which is instead of getting two copies you only get one copy and ravenous kraken sees basically zero play in standard right now so it's really going to be the, the the quality of the card is going to depend on how easy it is to make your cubicle live for multiple turns if you hit it for two turns then that's not too bad there are still some disadvantage of this but I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later on let's look at some cards though that you might want a cubicle an obvious class where the the cubicle might come into play is with death rattles and death rattles have a really nice deck right now in death knight it's not a tier one deck but it's pretty strong resker is in there you could play your resker for zero you play your carnivorous cubicle you hit your resker steal an opponent's minion and then at the end of the turn you get a resker back this kind of alludes to one of the disadvantages of this card, though, versus the, the cube. It is an end of turn added to your field, which means you can't use the rush effect on the, the Reska, which is a pretty big thing about the, the card. But still, that's actually a lot of potential value. It's going to give your opponent like a real headache because they want to destroy the cubicle. It means they leave Reska on the board. If they kill Reska, you know, it takes them to the minion. The minion you stole will also exist on the board. That might be another threat. So I think that is possible at the highest of high roll plays where you cubicle a Reska. 
You can also hit Frostbit and Freebooter. I think it's actually too slow for that deck. Uh, but that's another Death Rattle deck that exists out there. Where you just start freezing a bunch of your opponent's minions. And they start taking 5 damage whenever you hit one of the Frozen cards. You cubicle your Frostbit and Freebooter. It destroys it. And then you get Freebooter back at the end of the turn. Uh, the problem with this is though that... And it's kind of again what I'm alluding to. There are better ways to trigger Death Rattles in Death Knight. And actually for Hunter since it's a dual class card. I'd probably prefer to play Yodel in the deck than Cubicle, and Yodel comes up a turn sooner, which is, again, more advantageous. And you get the double Death Rattle trigger, which is better than hoping that the Cubicle lives for two turns. Also in Death Knight, you have Death Growl as well to spread the Death Rattle around for more minions. And some of those minions are actually easy to kill, which basically makes it like a Yodel-like effect. If you put it on the button, for example, it will automatically die at the end of the turn, and you'll get the Death Rattle effect up front, so... Cubicle maybe goes into this deck, but I actually don't think it needs this deck. Uh, maybe though, Paladin. They have a Noyo Troop, which is basically Void Lord, right? It's Mech Void Lord. A lot of stats with a very sticky board after that. Also, they have stuff like Pips, which is another good thing to Death Rattle. And they have Tear to bring the cards back. So maybe Carnivorous Cubicle. We're not going to be playing Cube Lock. We're going to be playing Cubidim instead, where you have this big. Paladin deck, maybe you put Kangor in there, maybe it's Kangor's dancing Cubidin. <laughs> maybe that's the deck, and you bring them all back with Tear and Tears, Tears, and that type of thing. I think it's not going to work, though. I think it's just going to be simply too slow for standard. Uh, another thing that this card could be seeing some play, and actually maybe this is one of the better ways it's going to see play in Paladin, is with Earthens. And it's not just that it could hit the Stoneheart King, which has a Death Rattle, it's also that it can hit the Earthens. And if you kill an Earthen, and you resummon it. The resummoned Earthen has plus two plus two stats versus the original, which is really good. And this is basically a card that has to be killed then at that point, because if you don't kill it, another Earthen comes out of it with another plus two plus two. So actually this summoning a card at the end of turn type things comes a little bit better, so to speak, in the sense that you're getting more and more stats from it. Uh, but again, it's a bit too slow. Certainly Priest has an Astral Automaton, but again, I think this is going to be just too slow for the Astral Automaton deck to run a kind of risk cubicle in there. You're probably more likely to run big stuff like the Obsidian Statue, and maybe Raden, for example, where you cube your Raden, and Raden will summon every card that you've played from your uh, hand that wasn't in your deck to begin with. So obviously that would require some specific deck design to make that work. Uh, but you'd get a pretty big advantage off the initial Death Rattle. And potentially, if, you know, they left the cube up, you get a board full of Radens. That is going to be a nightmare to deal with. Uh, Warrior also has its other advantages. They have the mech package, which, again, has some Death Rattles in there. And you have stuff like Boom to bring it back. Again, though, can Warrior keep the cube alive for multiple turns? I doubt it. Uh, and it's just some final additional cards. Warlock, funnily enough, still has Doomguard in the deck. They don't have Void Lord anymore, but they have Wretched Queen, which is pretty close to... Uh, void walker like do i think that q block was going to be a thing no i think without guldan and actually without a few other cards this deck just isn't good enough and actually just generally speaking i think if you had all the cards in q block in standard right now with the exception of the cube and you had the cubicle instead i actually don't think that deck would see play i think the cubicle is actually such a significant weakness versus the the cube basically because you can't abuse the death rattle very well on cubicle because he doesn't have one but you could have used the death rattle you can't abuse something a minion at the end of your turn effect like for example you could trigger your own cube with a doom guard and it would push out another 10 damage on top of the other five damage you would have done with the original doom guard uh carnivorous cubicle can't do that if you get a doom guard at the end of the turn you can't charge with it it's like it's not a good play with the cubicle so i just don't see cube lock being a thing there are some meme stuff as well you could do with ferrazane where you kill the ferrazane and bring a ferrazane back again and you know do some big elemental cube deck but i just don't see that being a thing there are some slightly more nuanced things if we're trying to get to this summon a copy at the end of turn effect and how we can like abuse that in some way because there's not many cards since it's not a keyword that say like you know your end of turn effect is triggered two times there's nothing like that in standard right now so you sort of want something that is summoned at the end of the turn that gives you an advantage going into your opponent's turn a uh, trapdoor spider is actually pretty good at doing this because if you play cube or cubicle sorry onto your spider at the end of the turn you get a one two stealth poisonous minion if your opponent tries to play a minion to respond to your minion the trapdoor spider kills it and then you know you get to your turn again at the end of your turn you get another trapdoor spider it kind of locks your opponent out of playing minions for a time being or at least 
it means they can't just play one big minion a turn. They'd have to play like a sacrifice before they could play their minion. Which means that, kind of speaking, it's more realistic that they just have to be killed with a spell than a minion. And some decks actually would struggle to do that. For example, Hand Buff Paladin would struggle to do that. Now, I will say on Hand Buff Paladin side of things, they have a lot of Divine Shield, in which case they could eat the Trapdoor Spider. So I, I think this is a bit of a meme, but it could be, a, you know, a fun little meme. Other fun memes, by the way, for this card, which has an advantage over potentially the cube to some degree, or at least it has some use with the summoner copy at the end of your turn effects, is minions that have dormant effects while they're dormant. Uh, for example, Dozing Dragon and Magtherodon, because what you could do is your Dozing Dragon wakes up from its slumber. It's done all its dormant stuff, or your Magtherodon wakes up from all of its dormant effects. And at the end of the day, you're then left with a 3-5 dragon or a 12-12 minion. And they're asleep and, you know, they're not doing anything particularly useful. And realistically, they're going to die before you actually get to do something with the minion itself. What you can do then, though, is when they wake up, you put them back to sleep again. You cube your dormant minion, and at the end of the turn, you get a copy of the minion, which I believe when it's resummoned will be dormant again. And you'll get the Dozing Dragon and the Magtheron effect. And I think the timing... Don't quote me on this one. I'm actually not very good at end of turn effect timings. I think you do get the effect of the dormant minion on the turn as well that you cube, because... Normally, end of the turn effects go in the order that they're played. So you would have played the cube before the Dozing Dragon, which comes up after the cube effect. I don't know if it misses its timing, though, because it checks for summoning end of turn effects before the Dozing Dragon comes into the field, so it doesn't check again for the end of turn effect of the Dozing Dragon. I'm actually not sure the way Hearthstone is coded that way, but I think you do get that effect. But uh, I don't know. Is that good enough for your cubicle? Probably not. I think overall in this matchup of Carnivorous Cubicle versus Carnivorous Cube, I think Carnivorous Cube is considered will be better. And therefore, I think Cubicle will see some testing because of uh, just some reminiscence of the past. And, you know, the, the, the past days where Hearthstone was better. Uh, I'm, I'm saying this very tongue-in-cheek right, right now. Based on what people, you know, moan about on Twitter all the time of, like, the good old days of Hearthstone. Uh... I, I think people will try to make cube decks, but I just don't think they'll be as good as the kind of risk cube decks of the past, simply because you can't keep this alive for multiple turns, or it's another death rattle to abuse. Anyway, that is all we're going to do for part two. Uh, I'll see how many more reveals are left going forward. Maybe we'll try and wrap this up in one more part. Uh, so far from the mini set, I think there's probably two decks that might get pushed up more. I think... From what we've seen right now, I think Big Spell Mage will be a thing. I also think maybe Pain Priest becomes a thing, but I'm looking forward to playing the mini set. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this. If you did, why not leave a like, comment, subscribe. Everything helps me out, and I'll see you next time. Bye!